this is our kickoff seminar for the Canadian Food Board semester. It is my great honor and pleasure you know, to introduce uh, today's uh, invited speaker, Dr. Yihan Hu. So she's a Kanye Associate Professor of uh, you know, School of Mechanical Engineering and also School of Mechanical and Environmental Engineering at Georgia Tech. So before going to Georgia Tech, so she was uh, uh, she was a faculty at the UIDC, and then so she received his uh, PhD, her PhD uh, from our university, so it's a major in engineering science, right? That's right. So before that, she got his master's degree from uh, uh, Singapore, that's uh, Mayo Technology. Mayo Technology. Technology. Uh, Technological University. university yeah. in Singapore, and then she received his bachelor's degree uh, from Shanghai Technology University in China. So actually, I have known uh, Yu Han. Oh, yeah, for quite a few years. Actually, when I was a when I was a graduate student, a PhD student, like Kathy, actually, like, like, like you guys, I, I know her, right, like a conference. So that's, that's from there we you know, get to know each other. So it's been uh, more than 10 years. So, uh, and then, uh, so her book actually focuses a lot on the chemical mechanics of uh, salt activators. So she's uh, definitely she's the right side of the areas of salt Materials. So it's my book. Uh, she has received uh, numerous uh, awards, especially the John Murphy Award. So that's why I just uh, I need to print out this page and to read out the all the you know the, uh, the awards. You know, she has Don't received. have to. <laughs> she has received the past five years. I would say so. She is the recipient of as a career award. You know, Air Force, Air Force, uh, yeah, uh, YIT award. Extreme Mechanics Lab at the Young Master Award, and also Journal of Applied Mechanics Award, ASME, SEAL, Lab and NASA, Early Career Award, ASME, Ashley Mechanics Award, SEM, uh, James Scott Young Master Award, and also SEM, Hopkins, uh, Cross Young Master Award. So let's welcome today's uh, speaker. Thank you. Thank you, dear, for the nice introduction, <laughs> and uh, thank you all for coming. And it's my great pleasure to be here. And uh, it's a rare uh, uh, occasion nowadays after the pandemic starts, so we have this opportunity to meet uh, uh, old friends and make new friends in person. And I'm very excited to be here to also to show, um, share with you our recent research. I try to throw in a couple of uh, new slides. We'll see how time goes. And uh, uh, hopefully there are uh, um, uh, no typos or things like that. <laughs> so um, as Jie mentioned, I'm a faculty in both mechanical engineering and chemical and biomolecular engineering. I have a lot of background in solid mechanics, a little bit background in chemistry. So I'm trying to merge these two to do something useful and hopefully uh, different. <laughs> so uh, um, chemo mechanics of uh, soft living materials. So it's interesting that to note uh, um, this development of uh, human history coincides with the development of uh, materials. Our survivability is really a lot depends on our capability of uh, uh, mastering the materials and uh, um, uh, materials of choice. So from, uh, um, but from a Stone Age, Bronze Age, Iron Age to even more modern engineering, we have mastered a lot of uh, materials, but uh, most of them, if not all of them, are solid materials. But if we look at these nature materials, right? Nature actually uh, has a, um, um, uh, a tool just beyond the solid uh, uh, components for making interesting materials. Uh, nature constantly mix and match different solid and liquid components, create a living material that uh, uh, coordinate uh, um, a cascade of a coupled reaction, diffusion, and deformation. As a result, many functions are realized, like uh, growth, healing, sensing, and so on. Those are uh, currently lacking. Uh, we are not doing as good as nature yet uh, in creating the materials and the functions. So I think our quest for new materials need to think beyond the solid components. And indeed, people have already started to look into that direction. In 1960s, people developed this 
so-called hydrogel materials. And primarily in the beginning is for um, uh, contact lens application. And this material is both solid-like and liquid-like. It resembles uh, uh, closely to the nature materials. It's composed of polymeric network and solvent molecules. Uh, it can retain shape because of the cross-link, uh, uh, the, the network are covalently cross-link. It can retain shape and bear load. But meanwhile, the solvent can transport through the network. It's also liquid-like. And because of this liquid media, it is an uh, ideal uh, environment to host the various chemical reactions. So a lot of functional molecules were incorporated into gels to make it uh, stimuli responsive. And as a mechanician, this uh, um, a versatile chemomechanical coupling uh, in this material system uh, interest, uh, uh, draw my interest. So over the years, uh, this because of this stimuli responsive property and uh, good biocompatibility, gels has been used in many uh, uh, new applications like uh, drug delivery, tissue culture scaffold, and because of the development of uh, 3D printing, 4D printing, uh, people have uh, uh, made it into um, uh, artificial organs and uh, wearers, uh, uh, wearable electronics, uh, um, soft robot, and so on. So I think the time is ripe for us to think about to develop quantitative tools for material design and uh, uh, development. So our effort is uh, uh, to uh, study uh, the mechanics of uh, this uh, uh, material and understanding the fundamental chemomechanical coupling in this material and uh, find a better way to characterize this coupled diffusion and the deformation of the material. And I'm going to tell you a little bit uh, uh, our efforts in both aspects uh, today. So first of all, a little bit of math in the beginning. So the way we approach to this multi-physics problem is to take this material element as an open system that can interact with the surroundings through many different channels, light irradiation, heat transfer, mass transport, mechanical force, and the electrical force, and so on. So based on this uh, physical picture, we can carefully lay out the first law and the second law. And through some standard uh, um, uh, man uh, 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 manipulation, we can reach uh, finally this uh, strong form of the combined first law and the second law. So every process of the material has to satisfy this law. And here, W is a Helmholtz free energy function. It's a function of a deformation gradient, electrode displacement, and the concentration of each mobile species. And uh, actually, if we look at this uh, inequality equation, in order to satisfy this inequality uh, relation all the time, these parameters in front of these uh, um, independent variables has to be set to zero all the time. It's just the pure mass. But actually, physically, this gives us uh, the constitutive relation of the material. I will elaborate in the next slides. And the rest defines the kinetic process. So here is uh, the constitutive relation that you have seen from the equal relation we got from the previous slides. And uh, this I want to emphasize, this is a fully coupled um, uh, constitutive relation. Uh, mechanics will influence the chemistry and the chemical reaction will influence uh, uh, deformation. So for example, this P is stress. And uh, because W is a function of all the different variables, not just the, the deformation, so the stress is related to not only deformation, but also like electric field and the chemical potential and so on. And this, uh, elect uh, this uh, is a chem uh, electrochemical potential of mobile species. Again, it's related to deformation as well. So this uh, theory is fully coupled. And the uh, Last the three terms actually defines the kinetic process. So in order to satisfy this inequality equation, each term here has to be always smaller or equal to zero. And the first term actually defines the, the chemical reaction direction. This is a chemical reaction rate. So this is a specific for different uh, uh, chemical reactions. So. Um, this, is, uh, uh, this defines uh, the diffusion kinetics. 
So uh, uh, this J is flux. In order to have it uh, being smaller or equal to zero all the time, simply we can just uh, have this uh, uh, linearly proportional to the gradient of a chemical potential with uh, a coefficient matrix in front of it. Actually, this is very interesting if uh, this matrix is uh, only the diagonal terms are non-zero, it recovers uh, this uh, um, a fixed law that we are familiar with. But uh, if uh, you have terms of the diagonal uh, term that are non-zero, it's actually uh, representing this uh, cross diffusion, meaning the flow of one species will influence the flow of other species as well. It's not just uh, driven by the chemical potential gradient of that own, uh, uh, particular species. And the last term uh, defines uh, the uh, heat transfer kinetics we are all very familiar with. And in most of the applications related to gel, this term is uh, uh, negligible because uh, this uh, um, uh, it usually doesn't heat to very uh, high temperature. Um, so with that, uh, uh, Beyond the constitutive relation and the kinetic relation, we also need uh, governing equations. Here, beyond this force balance, we also need to consider mass balance and uh, Gauss law because uh, now the material has uh, 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 mobile species coming in and out. The concentration change uh, can be related to flow of that particular species and also chemical reactions that generate or consume that species. And we have charges. We also need uh, in sometimes, uh, uh, sometimes consider this uh, uh, Gauss law. So with that, this uh, uh, theory so far is uh, general, okay? And it can be applied uh, to all the materials has coupled reaction diffusion and the large deformation. Right? And uh, what is different for different specific materials are these uh, uh, free energy function W as I, I introduced before, that uh, Helmholtz free energy function that is different for different uh, materials, and also these uh, chemical reaction kinetics. Okay? And now I'm going to give a specific example. The first one I want to talk about this is a photochemical reaction for making photoresponsive or light responsive hydrogels. Here are several widely used molecules for making light sensitive hydrogels. And this isobenzene spiral parent and uh, leucal uh, derivatives and so on. So for the first two, actually, this function molecule, when you shine light, it change configuration or generate dipoles that change interaction property between the molecule and the solvent that will drive the solvent to come in and out. So macroscopically, you will see this uh, swelling or contraction of the gel. You can use that as an actuation mechanism and so on. And uh, for this molecule, it actually is more interesting. When you shine light on, this bond is open up, generate two separate parts and uh, of separate charges. So we denote it as the red one here. When you shine light, it becomes uh, two separate parts with uh, uh, opposite ions. So in the following uh, modeling, I want to focus on this material system, and the model can be further simplified to cover, uh, to cover other cases as well. So when the light propagates through the material a certain distance, and the light is consumed for generating this uh, chemical reaction, so the forward reaction rate is uh, proportional to the number of photons that are absorbed by the material. And we also have a naturally thermal uh, activated backward reaction. If we equate the forward reaction and the backward reaction, we get a stationary state. Uh, this is general in chemistry, but here I wanted to emphasize the difference is uh, now you can't simply solve this equation independently. It has to be considered uh, coupled with deformation. The reason is the following. You can think. Uh, as you shine light to the material, it generates a chemical reaction, right? This chemical reaction will draw water coming in and out, and that will dilute your um, uh, chemical composition, also shift at the same time your 
uh, chemical equilibrium. So it's a coupled process. We really need to do coupled with mechanics to solve uh, uh, this uh, whole behavior of the material. So with this model, what we can do? I just uh, give one specific example. This is a leucocyanide uh, um, hydroxide molecule. And when you shine light, this bond will open up, generate a positive charge uh, and a negative charge, OK? Uh, it's a leucocyanide. So uh, people uh, couple it onto a temperature sensitive network. So this material is both temperature sensitive due to the main chain and uh, uh, light sensitive due to this uh, light responsive molecule. Okay, so what is interesting is here, when you don't shine light to it in a dark condition, the material just behave like a normal temperature sensitive hydrogel. When you increase the temperature, it shrinks, okay, at a particular temperature. And when you shine light to it, the transition temperature is shift because you disturb the interaction property between the solvent and the molecule after you generate this uh, 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 dissociation. So our model can capture this transition of uh, temperature, but meanwhile, we can capture something more, very subtle physics. So you can see uh, in uh, this uh, forward process, when you increase temperature, it jumps at a relatively higher temperature and coming back at a relatively lower temperature. And our model can capture all the stationary state of a possible transition state of this uh, um, uh, phase transition behavior. And what is interesting is you can see, right, this uh, um, from uh, this uh, green curve to this red curve, the temperature shift is very small. So in operation, if you want to get a light responsiveness of the material, meaning when you shine light, it uh, sh uh, swell or shrink dramatically, right? You have to operate in a very, very narrow temperature range. Here is just about uh, 1 or 1.5 degrees C. So without this quantitative tool, in reality, in experiment, you are very easy, it's very easy to miss uh, this uh, uh, performance behavior. So then we look at this, uh, we play around with uh, these uh, uh, um, photochemical gels. We found actually it's, uh, um, uh, 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 it has uh, some uh, general uh, drawbacks of uh, um, light sensitive uh, uh, gels. So if, uh, let's think about uh, comparing with other uh, responsive uh, hydrogels, like temperature sensitive gels uh, and the pH sensitive gels. Light is a better control, right? It can, you can control it locally, you can deliver it uh, uh, remotely and very uh, um, uh, uh, fast, right? But this uh, light sensitive gel is less applied in reality than a lot less applied than other uh, stimuli responsive gels. And actually, there are uh, reasons for that because uh, most of these molecules I show here uh, uh, can generate uh, this uh, 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 photo efficiency is very low. So you don't generate a lot of swelling ratio. That's one thing. Another thing is in order to keep the molecule in the activated state, meaning keep the gel in a swollen state, right? You have to constantly keep the light source there. Otherwise, it will come back. So in certain applications, it's not desirable. So um, for example, you can consider you have a, um, a complex light pattern shined on the gel. And as you shine light to it, it locally deform. And the material will generate a very complex global shape change. And then you lost the track on where you wanted to activate the material, the pattern uh, tracing. So in order to solve this problem, actually we come up with an idea that uh, to couple it with another light sensitive molecule in a way that they are activated in the same uh, wavelengths, but uh, they generate a complementary ions that can form a secondary reaction. This secondary reaction for, uh, serves uh, two purposes. For one thing, it uh, takes away the product so it lock uh, the, uh, the molecule in the activated state. For an another thing, that 
uh, this uh, um, uh, uh, taking away this uh, um, uh, uh, product will force the reaction more towards to the forward direction, so we can get a more swelling ratio. So you can see here, this is the original uh, gel. After light activation, it looks dark. It is uh, just uh, the molecule change uh, um, uh, color. And then uh, we take away this light source, and uh, the, uh, the material remembers this activation. Then we put it into water, it can swell, and the swell dramatically, so we can improve the photo efficiency and also decouple this activation and swelling process. And because uh, using light, we can generate, uh, uh, apply different uh, light intensities, so we can generate uh, a gradient of a different uh, swelling ratio. With that, we can program using um, uh, different uh, photo patterns to program a more complex shape of uh, the gel. For example, here, this is the photo mask that uh, uh, allow a uh, photo pattern actually allow more light uh, um, penetrating through uh, the outer region and the less in the middle. So this is how the gel look like after activation. And after we put it uh, in water, it becomes a shadow shape because it swells more in the outer region. And uh, we can accurately capture or uh, predict uh, this behavior using our model. And because of this uh, reaction, we take away the product, we can uh, give it back. So put it in a uh, high pH solution, it will recover. And we can come in with a different pattern, so it's reversible. So here we um, uh, come up with uh, uh, inverse uh, uh, pattern as the previous one, as a demonstration. So you have more light penetrating through in the middle and uh, less uh, on the outer region, so it becomes an a inverse dome shape this time. So this is just uh, to demonstrate uh, some capability. And then collaborate uh, with uh, my uh, colleague, uh, Alper, Alper uh, um, Erturk. We are trying to use this property of the material uh, for some application. So the simplest one that we tried is, uh, well, now we have this uh, gel beam. Right, and uh, we can shine light to it and generate this periodic structure. You can't do this uh, using uh, or, uh, this uh, previous uh, um, uh, light sensitive gel. It's because after you remove the light, it will come back to the original uh, shape. But now we can keep this shape. And uh, my colleague took the sample and shake it from the top and measured the vibration from the bottom. We wanted to see whether this periodic structure can give us some interesting uh, uh, wave propagation or vibration propagation property. So indeed, you see this is uh, homogeneous. This black line is uh, the vibration uh, amplitude at the uh, end of the beam as a function of frequency. And uh, for this periodic beam, you see at a certain frequency range, this uh, uh, vibration uh, magnitude is significantly reduced. It is uh, generating the so-called band gap. And this band gap can be tuned by tuning this pattern, like uh, the swelling and the swollen and the non-swollen region, the length ratio, and so on. Because it's reversible, we can wash it out and come back with a different pattern. So this is just a little bit of demonstration. And another thing we found is, uh, um, uh, so using our gel, it's not just to simply change uh, the uh, molecule configuration or interaction with uh, the solvent. It generates free ions. So we, we realize maybe this material can have a different uh, uh, conductivity, electric conductivity. So indeed, we tested uh, without this functional molecule, you see one, uh, light is on and off, this uh, conduct resistance does not change. But uh, with more of these uh, uh, functional molecules, this uh, one uh, UV light is on, this uh, conductivity significantly increase, or the resistance significantly reduced. So it becomes more conductive. And it can recover, and uh, uh, it's uh, um, uh, reversible. You can do it many times. So just to play around with this, this is a simple uh, demonstration my student did. So this is the piece of gel and it's connected to two uh, LEDs through these two strips. So it's uh, two circuits, and when we shine light, both dim, right? And uh, uh, when he covers one side, so only this side is conductive, this side is not. So you can see we can control this uh, 
uh, this uh, circuit uh, um, uh, independently. So we call it a rewritable circuit. So you can use light to uh, induce a local conductivity change of the material. So here is just another uh, interesting demonstration. He made this uh, um, uh, into a soft pad. So here on the top, uh, he made it like a, a, a calculator. So you can use it uh, to couple with computer as an uh, input. And on the bottom, so we wash, uh, this is the same piece of gel, wash off uh, this uh, pattern and shine light to the whole region. So the whole region is conductive. Now he can draw on it. And not only that, and this uh, also uh, recognize uh, the uh, pressure that you apply uh, to draw different uh, 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 widths of the line. OK, this is another demonstration. My student put these uh, uh, electric patterns onto this uh, hydrogel and make it uh, uh, artificial uh, retina. So this, uh, this whole thing is inside this, make it uh, like a, a mimetic eye. And uh, so this is a display um, uh, as an input. And this uh, uh, material will recognize this light uh, uh, stimuli and uh, translate it into electric signal so we can recognize uh, the pattern on the computer. So it's just an interesting, simple demonstration. So in that previous example I showed, it's a simple chemical reaction, photo dissociation. So now we want to move on to more complex chemical reaction. So in the past, uh, we work with these uh, pendant molecules that generate a chemical reaction. Now we think beyond whether we can remodify this uh, uh, main network of uh, the hydrogel. So the idea comes from the following, from the theory we know when you mix this solvent and the molecule, they want to mix because that will maximize uh, your entropy of mixing. But meanwhile, the polymer chains are also straightened. The elective, uh, electric, uh, elastic energy is very high, and uh, the network doesn't like to be stretched. To a certain extent, that defines the ultimate swelling amount. Right? And the idea we, we were thinking about is whether we can get rid of this constraint, change the covalent bond on the uh, main chain into dynamic bond. So now, you can open up the bound and uh, incorporate more monomers, for example, to release this stress. Then you can keep uh, swelling and reacting so you can continuously grow. So that is the idea. So this is a schematic that in our mind, if you have these dynamic sites in the active sites in the network, when you swell it with new monomers, this network is stretched. And it's not comfortable that way, so it opens up to let more monomers, the new network, homogenize with the old network to homogenize the stress. Now the network is more relaxed then you can absorb more monomers and keep growing. So this is one set of chemistry we tried in the very beginning. So this is a real like monomer, and in the presence of acid or um, base solution, and uh, it, will be, uh, it will work as a catalyst, this ring will open up and uh, connect together to form the network. And uh, in the presence, as long as your catalyst is acid, our base uh, is uh, um, uh, uh, active, so this dynamic network uh, constantly uh, exchange with neighbors to homogenize the stress. So that will allow us to do this growing. And uh, you can see, indeed, it follows our prediction for this uh, um, when we turn off this uh, dynamic bond exchange reaction in the material, it just uh, swell. Right, this red line is prediction, and uh, the dots are experiments. So it swells only to a certain extent, and then when we extract all the solvent out, it comes back to the original size and shape. But uh, if we turn the uh, change, change reaction on, then it keeps uh, uh, swelling, it keeps becoming bigger, and if uh, at a certain point we extract out all the solvent in it, so you see this uh, um, uh, polymer becomes bigger than the original one. So the monomer is really incorporated onto the main chain. And uh, 
uh, this uh, uh, monomer and uh, um, uh, cross-linker, as uh, it grows, you can change the ratio. So as it grows, you can grow it to be stronger or weaker. So the Young's modulus can be changed as well. So what we can do is uh, we also uh, showed that this material can grow and degrow. So, um, uh, and it's repeatable. One interesting demonstration we did is uh, we punch a hole in it and uh, put uh, this uh, um, just uh, um, a brush on this catalyst here. So this uh, uh, material just uh, grow towards uh, to this direction and eventually merge together as one single piece. So this is uh, self-healing we demonstrated, but different from previous uh, uh, demonstrations. It's not that uh, uh, um, uh, glue like uh, two pieces together. It's really growing to fill the big hole there. Okay. And uh, we uh, also tried a different chemistry with this idea. Now using this, we can do radical polymerization. So we can use the light uh, to control the growth. We can do local growth. And the interesting, because we have this model that can help us to understand the kinetics and the morphology coupling in the material. So you can see uh, this is uh, uh, axisymmetric simulation. The light is uh, shining in this region. So when this, uh, um, this uh, uh, reaction is uh, slow, diffusion is fast, so you have uh, enough uh, uh, supply of uh, this uh, nutrient, uh, as I, I like to call it, and so it uh, um, uh, grows, and uh, so grows more smoothly. Uh, but if uh, uh, this uh, uh, diffusion is slow and the reaction is fast, so you don't have enough nutrients supplied to the middle part. It's already polymerized here, grown here. So it uh, grows into a different uh, morphology. So it's really coupled uh, diffusion reaction and the deformation problem. And with that uh, um, uh, knowledge in mind, we can fine tune this performance. Now we can do it in high resolution. This is just a random picture we download from online, use it as a photo mask. And then you shine light to it, it generated this 3D uh, um, uh, uh, like picture uh, on, on the surface. And this, uh, um, uh, arrow, uh, this uh, um, scale bar you can see is uh, 200 micron. We can do it in very high resolution. Okay, so um, now I want, uh, with uh, the rest of the time, I wanted to switch gear. How am I doing with time? Yeah. Okay, 15 minutes, good. Okay, so um, <clears throat> uh, beyond uh, this uh, uh, modeling, in order to get a, a quantitative uh, um, characterization of the model, we need uh, to characterize the material uh, accurately. And because of this coupled deformation and the diffusion, so we need uh, to rethink about uh, the traditional material characterization. So we need to characterize both mechanical and the trans property, transport properties in the material. And uh, <clears throat> also, uh, mechanical characterization of soft material is uh, very challenging. I gave uh, several uh, examples that uh, the material we are familiar with just to give you some physical feeling. Most of them are very soft and uh, slippery and some of them are saggy. It's very difficult to do conventional tensile testing, compression, and torsion. But comparatively, indentation is very simple. You just have the sample there and compress on it. But difficulty for using indentation is mostly from the theoretical aspect. Uh, different from tensile testing, this is inhomogeneous deformation. And uh, when you consider this coupled deformation and uh, uh, diffusion, it's even more complex. Within this contact area, you have a displacement boundary and the impermeable boundary, and outside is permeable. So you can use a, a finite element simulation to calculate uh, this uh, um, uh, performance uh, problem. No, uh, there is no problem with that. But the goal here we, we have is uh, we wanted to generate an analytical solution or semi-analytical solution so that people without a mechanics background who do not know how to run simulation can extract the material properties by themselves. 
pay. So uh, looking at this uh, um, uh, method to characterize time-dependent behavior of uh, gels, so there are several widely used uh, methods like creep test, the relaxation test, and the oscillation test. Actually, uh, this creep test is uh, uh, most widely used because it's a force control that the equipment are naturally built that way. And, but uh, it's uh, uh, not a good uh, um, method to characterize the coupled deformation and the diffusion uh, behavior of gel for the following reason. So in creep test, we apply a constant force and measure the indentation depth as a function of time. Right? As it, uh, uh, this contact, uh, uh, this uh, indentation depth change, the contact area also change. And the time uh, uh, character of this problem is defined by the diffusion. And the diffusion is related to length, which is the size of indentation. And uh, as your contact radius keeps changing, your characteristic time keeps changing, it's very difficult to get a clean solution out of it. So with that in mind, we realize relaxation test is better. You keep a constant indentation depth and uh, measure the force as a function of time. So the contact area does not change, uh, and characteristic time does not change. It gives you uh, more possible, uh, it's more possible to get a clean solution out of it. And oscillation test is also good, but uh, uh, you have to apply a trick here. You have to apply a big indentation depth in the beginning, so you generate a big contact area, but the subsequent uh, um, oscillation in small amplitude, so the contact radius change during that time can be neglected. So I will talk about that. And uh, um, uh, after determining what method to use, we also need to quantify this behavior of material. So in literature, there are two ways in general to uh, model the material. One is this uh, thermodynamic model as I just uh, uh, presented. This is good because it's a physics-based model. The material parameters are directly related to molecular feature of the material. So uh, it has a physical meaning, but the theory is very complex. So at the end of the day, it's very difficult to get an analytical solution, and you still have to do curve fitting to get uh, uh, material properties. But in uh, literature, there are also another theory called uh, power elasticity. But uh, uh, this is well-established theory, and it's, uh, you have a lot of uh, uh, existing green function that you can take advantage to get uh, the analytical solution or semi-analytical solution of uh, the problem. But uh, these uh, material parameters are phenomenological. But uh, we wanted to take advantage of both. So the idea is uh, when we develop this indentation method, based on linear power elasticity. So we can extract, get a simple solution, extract the material parameters without the curve fitting. And then we will try to link these power elastic phenomenological parameters to the physical parameters in the thermodynamic theory. So here is uh, um, actually my uh, PhD work many years ago when I was working with Zhigang. We look at this uh, uh, relaxation method and we found that actually for this complex problem, we can find a very simple um, uh, uh, scaling relation that if we normalize the force relaxation curve as uh, um, uh, in this way, it becomes a, a function of one single non-dimensional parameter dt over a squared, d is diffusivity, a is contact radius, right? And uh, so the curve you see here is master curve. It's only different for different shape of indenters. So from now on, people don't have to do numerical simulation anymore. They can just use this uh, uh, curve to get uh, material properties. And for ease to use, I fit it with a continuous function so people can directly use it to extract the material parameter. So here is uh, one set of early experiment I did, uh, apply this uh, uh, indentation relaxation on an uh, alginate gel. Here is the force as a function of time for three different indentation depths. And uh, here I just want to draw your attention that we normalize the force by AH, A is contact radius, H is indentation depth. This is to scale with as stress, so put them easy, uh, on the same scale to compare. You can see very clearly for larger size of indentation, the relaxation time is longer. So this relaxation time depends on length. So this is a d 
different from viscoelastic behavior. So for viscoelastic behavior, the time character is, uh, should not depend on length. So this actually proves that the time-dependent behavior of gel is mostly dominated by transport behavior rather than viscoelastic reconfiguration of the polymer chains, very different from polymers. So then, indeed, we normalize the T by A squared, length squared. This is diffusion, right? Diffusion length squared. They collapse into one single curve. And using our method, we can easily extract the power elastic properties. So here, I just want to say that method worked very well. We use it uh, uh, to test many different gels. But later, when I become an independent PI, I want to apply it in smaller scale for biomedical applications. And the reason is because a lot of these uh, biomaterials has a nature on um, this uh, inhomogeneity. You have to probe the local properties using small size. And for the other, that a lot of the material are time sensitive. So if you have a smaller size of indentation, the relaxation time is much shorter, so you can finish the test much faster. But when we apply this relaxation test on this in small scale, we meet a lot of problems. It's not practical for the following reason. When you uh, reduce the size of indentation, this relaxation time becomes shorter, so the ramping time becomes significant. So you have to ramp it up, load it super fast, and be able to hold it there for a longer time, keep the displacement constant for a long time. All these are very challenging in small scale, thermal drifting and everything that matters. So this is not practical, but we found actually practically using AFM, we can do very uh, good uh, repetitive measurement in typing mode, so oscillation mode. That motivated us to revisit this problem theoretically for this dynamic indentation problem. Just a uh, uh, long story short, we actually found uh, a master curve for this problem as well. And uh, this time it's even simpler. It's independent of the shape of indenter. No matter what shape of indenter you use, the behavior should follow the master behavior you see here. So delta is uh, the uh, face lag when you apply this uh, displacement uh, um, uh, sweeping through different frequency, measure the force uh, as a function of uh, time. So you get uh, this phase lag as a function of uh, frequency. And if we normalize this uh, frequency, all the curves should collapse into this uh, um, curve you see here. And it's only different for different uh, persons ratio defined in power elasticity. It's drain the Poisson's ratio, meaning you squeeze water out, wait until it reaches equilibrium, and see how much contraction you get in other directions. It's so-called drain the Poisson's ratio. It tells you how much water you can squeeze out of the network. And uh, it's understandable if you have a, a smaller Poisson's ratio that you can squeeze a lot of water out so during this loading and now unloading, you have a more dissipation. So this phase lag value is bigger. So uh, in reality, when you extract a material property, you don't even need the whole curve. You only need to know the peak value theoretically and compare with the with experiment. You can get all the material properties. This is the one set of experimental uh, result on polyacrylamide gel in small scale. Uh, we tested this uh, black line is uh, applied displacement and this is measured force. This is over one cycle of loading oscillation. You can see we get uh, this uh, hysteresis. And for different indentation depths, uh, you also see this uh, peak characteristic time depends on line length. And if we normalize it by a length scale squared, uh, it collapse into one single curve. Again, confirm it's a power elastic uh, uh, behavior, and we can easily use our formula to extract the material properties. So now the question is, how do we link the power elastic property to thermodynamic properties of gels? So for a simple uh, 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 neutral gel system, 
uh, this free energy of a gel is composed of stretching energy and the mixing energy. And for stretching energy, we just adopt the simplest the new hooking model and that is a binary solution for this uh, uh, energy of mixing, and those formulas were derived, uh, derived many years ago. And then what we did is to compare this uh, nonlinear theory with uh, the linear theory, with uh, this shear modulus Poisson's ratio we can measure from indentation. We want to extract the thermodynamic parameter N is related to crosslink density, chi is uh, the interaction parameter, describe the enthalpy of mixing what's the chemical affinity between the solvent and the polymer. And uh, um, we did the linear perturbation compared with the nonlinear theory. At the end of the day, we get these two algebraic equation, very simple equation. For measured shear modular Poisson's ratio, we can calculate n and chi. So we did a verification on PDMS swollen in various organic solvent system. So using indentation method, we measured shear modulus and the Poisson's ratio. And uh, actually, this, uh, uh, we calculate N and chi. N times KT is actually the shear modulus of dry PDMS before it swells in any organic solvent. And we can do independent measurement to compare with our independently calculated value. It compares very well. And this, uh, uh, what is interesting is about chi. Chi is a chemical parameter. Actually, for PDMS system, in literature, people have used uh, many different chemical ways to, character, uh, to measure this chi. And our mechanically characterized uh, chi value is very close uh, to literature reported uh, um, uh, value. So uh, at the end, this is the last slide. I want to just uh, to draw your attention that uh, at this point, uh, I have shown that indentation method works. But an often pro question that I got from the audience is, uh, what about the adhesion between the indenter and the gel, right? And uh, <clears throat> we have always been argued that uh, it's uh, negligible. Now, only until recently, we, integrate, uh, we have an uh, integrated uh, uh, AFM and the confocal. So while we measure this force, apply this placement, we can visualize how the material deform at the same time. So you can see this is the indenter, this is the gel. So we can cal cal uh, characterize, we can measure the contact radius as a function of uh, holding time. So you can see this uh, line, this straight line is uh, from a Hertzian solution, which is from no adhesion solution. And uh, they compare with uh, this theoretical value very well. So actually, this uh, adhesion between hydrogel and uh, um, uh, indenter is very weak because 90% uh, of it is water in the gel. It doesn't influence uh, the characterization. But uh, the story doesn't end there. It's, uh, when we look at this problem, it's more interesting than that. So this, uh, we measure this uh, force, apply displacement, compress it in, and measure this force, and hold it there for a certain time so it uh, relax. So this uh, loading period, you see this fits Hertzian solution, again, no adhesion solution very well. And the contact radius during holding time does not change. So adhesion doesn't play a role in this relaxation force measurement process. But when you retract it, you see significant uh, adhesion. So it does develop adhesion between the indenter and the gel over time during holding, but it doesn't influence uh, the force profile that you measure. But this adhesion is called so-called adhesion hysteresis. This is very interesting. I won't have time to tell you uh, in this talk uh, um, uh, today, but we have a theory to look at this time-dependent uh, adhesion hysteresis as well. So with that, I just want to close my talk. I hope that I convinced you that GEL is a good platform to incorporate different versatile chemical reactions into material to realize the more lifelike functions. 
and uh, chemomechanical modeling can really help us to gain precise engineering control and the design of uh, new materials. And uh, we also need uh, to rethink our material characterization for these new materials. And uh, with that, I would like to thank my student for the work and the funding agent. And any questions, thank you for your attention. That's a very good question. So uh, usually we use a, a spherical tip. So because it doesn't generate a significant uh, stress concentration, and a lot of these materials are like a jello. So it's very easy to break. Uh, so we use sphere, but we have a solution for different shape of indenters. So if uh, you use a different uh, shape of indenter to measure it, we can also extract the properties uh, easily, yeah. That's a very good question. So uh, that depends on what size you want to probe, right? And uh, for the uh, AFM measurement, we use, I actually forgot to mention that we use a sphere uh, about uh, uh, 20, uh, 25 micron, and indentation depth is usually um, uh, uh, a few micron, uh, hundreds of nanometer to a few uh, 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 micron, that size. But uh, the early experiment that I showed you, this relaxation test that is uh, in bulk shape. So the, uh, the sphere is a centimeter size. Yeah. Yes. Oh, that's a good question. We, we, uh, uh, we submerge everything in water, AFM tip and also the sample. So we wanted to, we need to uh, keep this uh, uh, equilibrium uh, condition. But in certain cases, if uh, you can finish the measurement very fast, it wouldn't influence the result either if you expose it, yeah. The sphere. Yeah, in certain situations, we do need uh, to reduce uh, the um, uh, adhesion. So uh, we make our own tip. So we have a micro manipulator. We make our own cantilever and a tip that gives us the, the flexibility to the surface chemistry before putting the sphere onto the cantilever. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you can't use uh, this. Uh, uh, in that case, yes, the theory has to be uh, re-evaluated. But for material characterization, if you are just interested in material characterization, you want to use a stiff sphere. So you can have this simple solution to extract the material property. But for your application, maybe you are interested in the just the soft-soft the soft interaction. Then you have to um, collaborate with mechanics people. Or if you are mechanics people, I don't know, you have to solve the boundary value problem by yourself. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So uh, if we control the temperature field of the material, so can we make the material repeat this process to make the material vibrate? Oh, that's a, a good question. Uh, short answer, no. Uh, the reason is because it's very slow. It's diffusion uh, driven. So when you reduce the size of uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the gel, you can reduce the time, but I don't think it's going to be fast enough for uh, vibration purpose. So the typical diffusivity is 10 to minus 10 uh, meters square per second. 
if you have a, a millimeter, let's say 100 micron um, size of a sample, you still need a, um, like a, a minute or tens of second to for it to, uh, uh, to swell, to deform. Yeah. Thank you. That's a very good question. That's actually related to the previous question about the size, right? So in order for everything here, we have uh, to work, right? We have to probe the material in the continuum length scale. So the network size of the material, so the molecular uh, aspect, uh, that length scale you worry about is about uh, a few nanometer to 10 nanometer at the most. And uh, the contact radius we probe is a few micron. So we certainly are probing the material in continuum level. Yeah, so that's a good point. We use AFM in a non-conventional uh, way, not mapping this uh, uh, very, very small uh, uh, length scale. We don't use a sharp tip, yeah. Yes. Uh, no, because the, the gel that we look at is a uh, um, uh, uh, network with a solvent. It's not a porous. So you don't have that uh, porous uh, uh, sense of matrix that collapse. So, uh, and uh, the deformation we induced is uh, small. So you just compress it 5%, uh, 10%. You don't uh, um, uh, collapse it. And also this uh, solvent transport is continuous in the micron size uh, uh, length scale when we look at it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, man. Yeah. Hey, Mentor. Yeah, just bring her. Yeah, thank you for coming. Yeah. I'm good. Yeah. yeah. Uh, do you want to delete my slides? Hey, Nihon.